you to our March uh, colloquium talk. Uh, today we're going to hear from uh, Dr. Tracy Hanshu. Uh, she joined EOU as an assistant professor of history in the fall of 2022. She teaches uh, several courses related to her research interests like the American West, Women in the West, uh, the West in Film, Cattle Empires, and a new course called The History of Rodeo. Her scholarship on the rural American West explores feminism in ranching women and rodeo cowgirls at the turn of the 20th century. She is a recipient of the 2021 Western Heritage Wrangler Award for her most recent publication. Here she comes wearing them britches, saddles, riding skirts, and social reform in the turn of the century rural West. Published in the academic journal Montana, the magazine of Western history. She is the author of Oklahoma Rodeo um, Women, Oklahoma Rodeo Women, excuse me, um, and an article for the Chronicles of Oklahoma Rodeo in Oklahoma in Women's uh, Business, How Lucille Mulhall's Fame Created Opportunity in Rodeo, which she received the Muriel H. Wright Award from the Oklahoma Historical Society. Her current work, One Lightning Yellow Hair Cowgirl, Sheridan's 1883 challenge to hypermasculinity in the Western genre examine, examines Taylor Sheridan's epic 1883 and his use of a female lead character to challenge hypermasculinity in the Western and is under review at the University of Oklahoma Press. She's an officer for the Rural Women's Studies Association and also serves on the advisory board to Americana, the Journal of American Popular Culture. Locally, she serves on the Landmarks Historical Commission here in Legrand. Outside of work, Dr. Hanshu enjoys cooking, photography, and time with her dog, Mabel. So without further ado, I turn it over to Dr. Hanshu. Thank you. Good afternoon, and thank you for coming. Um, thank you to Steve Tanner for encouraging me to, to do this this year. And thank you, Jared, for the introduction. I just found out they are the entire colloquium committee, so thank you for all the work that you do. Uh, I also am thankful for the Faculty Scholars Program, which awarded the funds for me to uh, complete the research on this project, uh, which is actually a book under contract with the University of Nebraska Press. Um, I also need to shout out to Nicole Howard in the back. Um, she's our history department chair and my colleague Paul Nowart who's presenting at a conference um, because they are wonderfully supportive colleagues and I very much um, appreciate working in an environment like that. So thank you. Um, I will apologize to all of you now. I was sick week before last and my voice just seems like it's not back in shape. So I will do my best. If you can't hear me, let me know at some point and I'll try to speak up. Um, I grew up in Texas around rodeo. My dad rodeoed, he rode bulls um, when he was young. We had cattle and we used our horses to move and work the cattle, which is kind of another word for vaccinating them and taking care of their health needs. And so naturally I'm drawn to ranching and rodeo and the women who made that history. Um, an opportunity presented itself for me to research this topic when I was completing my master's degree at Syracuse University. And for my thesis there, I had planned to examine how ranching women in the American West supported the national suffrage movement. My students love this story, by the way. Um, it seemed logical to me because Wyoming is the first territory to have woman suffrage which they do in December of 1869. They are also the first state to issue women's suffrage or to, to hold women's suffrage in 1890. And of the 14 states in the West that gave women the vote uh, before the 19th Amendment to the Constitution, secured that nationally in 1920, all but one was in the American West. Um, so it seemed logical to me to research that. I'll clarify for you here, there were some other states that were allowing women to vote, but only in presidential elections. So in Wyoming and the other states and territories in the West, women could vote in any election. 
Um, also, women in the West, um, women in the West had worked in tandem with men, meaning they did what was viewed at the time as men's work. So similarly, um, uh, with women's work, when um, needed, sometimes that was an arrangement that they had on small farms and ranches, uh, men would do women's work. Um, and so they would kind of take turns or do whoever would, would do whatever they had the best skills. Um, so the silver lining was for women who liked to work outdoors that um, they could do so. And many of them preferred an afternoon on horseback to doing the dishes. No surprise there, right? Um, <laughs> and, and a lot of times uh, men would, would do things in the house. I know at least one ranch woman um, um, admitted that her husband's biscuits were much better than her own, so they liked for him to be the one to do that chore. So um, all of this together led me to look at this topic, and my initial hypothesis was wrong. This is where the students love this. Um, it was wrong. It turns out that these women had everything they needed. And furthermore, they had very little in common with the women in the national suffrage movement. So in reworking my thesis to learn why they really didn't care about the national suffrage movement, I came across these rodeo cowgirls. These women were living extraordinary lives for the time, and I've been researching them ever since. Thus the book branding their own. So why then were these women left out of mainstream women's history? That's the question. They're so exceptional in my mind. So um, in looking at this, I want to talk just a minute about um, the historiography, and then I have a little more background work to do, and I promise we will get to the cowgirls themselves, if you'll allow me just a few moments. So like other previous um, groups that have been excluded from history, women's history often starts the narrative with those who are associated with history makers. And so sometimes it's um, a woman who is married to someone who's famous, like Abigail Adams, the wife of John Adams, um, or it might be women who commit uh, first acts, or who are the first ones recognized, I should say, the first recognized in history. So, for example, the first Supreme Court uh, justice that was a female appointed to the court was Sandra Day O'Connor. And Sandra Day O'Connor, by just if you didn't know, grew up on a ranch in Arizona known as the Lazy Bee. Um, and she talks about how much that was a, an important part of her life. Other women who are written into history are those who protest loudly, those who are public in trying to make legislative change. Those are the women we call the radicals. And I think in some part, this is, this is where that negative stigma uh, kind of comes from. When we see women, and if, you, if you're talking to someone and you say, I research feminism, and they go, ooh, ah, that's horrible. Those radical women. Um, and so women like Alice Paul, Betty Friedan, Billie Jean King, Gloria Steinem, you can just go on and on are the women who worked for political change. And that's also about the same time frame in the 1960s when we start to really see a negative connotation about feminism come about. So beyond this feminist activity that's based on political activism, um, I believe, and in connection with those larger movements that largely have urban um, origins. I believe that women create change without being involved in that. Everyday, ordinary women, what that looks like are women who advocate for changes that are local, regional, and that really make changes in their own lives, something that's very similar to a grassroots movement. And that's exactly what we see women in rural areas doing more often than not, and it's something that these rodeo cowgirls do. And I mention this because there are some feminist theory, theorists who believe that you have to uh, be in front of the camera 
that you have to have the picket sign and that you have to proclaim yourself to be a feminist in order to make measurable change. And I argue that that's really not the case. The problem with this methodology um, is it limits women's history. And for, um, um, by just limiting it to episodic major events, it really overlooks the fact that the majority of the female population in the United States until just very near to suffrage being passed lived in rural areas. The population doesn't shift from the rural to urban majorities until 1920. So the majority of women have been living in rural areas up to that point. And the, the question was to me, why didn't we look at these women a little closer? This is the majority of the population. So I think that it's necessary for us to do that, to look at how women in, in their rural lives gained, especially in the West, liberties ahead of a national movement. They were voting, they owned property, they had non-traditional employment. All of these seemed to be feminist um, goals. So they have this in the West before the national movement, and how did it come about? How did it happen? So my efforts in this project are really to examine the lives of ranching, cowgir ranching cowgirls and rodeo professional cowgirls in the early 20th century to determine how their use of rodeo and their related careers contributed to gains in employment and independence um, through their rodeo career. Um, this provided opportunities for them that were non-existent to women in your urban settings at the time. And I think it helps present a more comprehensive view of women's history when we include these women. I promise, I'm getting to the cowgirls. So, what is feminism? Um, this is some of the work that I did uh, with the research grant last summer, kind of adding and expanding the book a bit to redefine uh, feminism a little bit more clearly. I looked at labor records, and I also looked at activism in the West, which the um, editor and I had discussed um, in, in working on the book. So a very basic definition from Miriam Webster, the belief in and advocacy of the political, economic, and social equality of the sexes expressed, especially through organized activity on behalf of women's rights and interests. Hmm. It doesn't say you have to call yourself a feminist. Um, and it doesn't really say that you have to be part of one of those three areas, political, economic, I would say, or social equality. Um, so a couple of things. Uh, the definition of feminism has been pretty contentious since its inception, um, largely because feminists themselves can't really agree on what it means. If you look at the definition of feminism in American history, it largely is uh, consistent of middle class white women, uh, those who came out of the antebellum north, and in that case, cowgirls and feminists kind of go together like oil and water. And so um, it, in, in that context, it may make sense that women who were in the rural west didn't have as much in common with that larger group. The word itself, feminism, originates in France in the 1880s, spreads through Europe before moving into North and South America in 1910. So um, there are also other subcategories because as scholars, we don't often limit our definitions to the dictionary. We like to think about those in a little more depth. Um, liberal feminism narrows the focus of women activists with a specific political agenda. Um, as does Marxist feminism and an anti-capitalistic activism. Ecofeminism uh, is often studies the relation of spiritual effects to the patriarchal system in nature. And so I kind of wanted to just clarify that in rural areas, um, there may be certain points in history that have been viewed, where, where the rural areas have been viewed as being more conservative um, but even that doesn't necessarily mean that the cowgirls failed to associate with those feminists because of that. I think we've got um, um, a different viewpoint from them happening, and we'll, we'll talk more about this in just a moment. 
In the case of the rural West, the circumstances for survival required women to remove social standards that would have limited their role in working on ranches, which was necessary for the success, especially in early um, expansion. So um, again, this, this study um, really looks at the efforts that these women made in their lives within the context of the arena and their ranches um, through a lens of the possibility of a rural feminism. So I'm looking at it as, as a little bit outside of these categories. Um, if we look at what their needs were in their environment, then maybe we can measure how important those gains were that they were um, actively pursuing, those liberties that they were using um, to live their lives the way that they wanted, which was much freer than um, uh, women in the rest of the country. We might have a framework to look that can be applied to other women in rural areas. And these cowgirls um, really influence not only uh, their local areas because of the nature of rodeo, they end up influencing people nationally and even internationally. All right, so to the cowgirls, finally. Um, what are the three main ways that they live feminist type activity or live as feminist? The number one is the work that they do and the professional careers that they developed. Uh, second is the independence they have. As I mentioned before, most women in the United States at the turn of the century and into the 1920s are not traveling independently. They might travel with their family, depending on their income, or with a chaperone. But they're not traveling independently. They're not managing their own careers, and these professional careers, um, in this case, are athletic. This is the first professional sport in the United States for women. Um, they also are able to continue working after they marry and have their children. And if you're not familiar with women's history, um, in some ways this still comes up today, <laughs> but it certainly will come up through the end of the Cold War. Um, also, fashion changes. And there's some wonderful scholarship on fashion and how women represent themselves through fashion and how that, those choices in themselves um, can be a form of activism. All right, so how did we get there? Rodeo really starts in remote locations with competition between ranch outfits. They um, would often meet after a roundup and the cowboys and the vaqueros would gather to see who could rope the fastest, who could uh, brand the cattle the fastest. And they had other skills and contests that were related to um, their job, related to their work as cow hands. Now, um, some of them rode wild steers and some of them broke horses. Um, and by that, I mean taming a horse that they could use as a saddle horse to work the cattle or move cattle around. Um, and what happens is that, as you can see, women are there too. Girls grow up on the ranch. The first generation of ranchers that we see um, often do not have enough helpers. Some of them don't have sons, and so they teach their daughters to ride very young. These girls grow up thinking this is the normal way of life. This little girl, as you can see, has her brother's clothes on. So she's riding a stride, and I'll come back to why that's important in just a moment. So they grow up with this new norm, and these ranching women will set um, kind of a new idea, a new identity. We have a new uh, feminine hegemony that, that develops in ranching culture. The Buckley sisters that you see here are working as cowhands on their family ranch. Now they're wearing split skirts um, to do the work, but by the time this picture is made in 1894, they're riding astride like a man, or as sometimes the newspaper at the time called it, 
clothespin style. So, <laughs> so this is this is a significant change from the norm. Women in the United States um, wear, or excuse me, ride side saddle until about 1910, and there are women who have um, been confronted some who were fined for violating city codes for riding into town like a man. So um, that's another side project that I'm working on, the women who were arrested for riding like this and wearing split skirts or pants to town. So um, these girls grew up working on and off the ranches. They learned how to train horses. And this leads them to a life in uh, rodeo, careers in rodeo. Um, again, it kind of establishes a unique precedent in these independent women who are working in male occupations and the fact that they're able to pursue this career after they marry is even more astonishing. So um, because the uh, early rodeo contestants largely come from ranching backgrounds, and this is the case until the 1930s, the majority of rodeo contestants are raised on ranches. And um, because of that, a large portion of the book looks at ranching women and how we go from the first to the second generation trying to push for a little bit more leniency in what they're wearing to the third generation expecting it to be normal to ride astride and normal to wear either a split skirt or pants to do that. Um, it takes about three generations. And so um, it was normal for them to, to be part of these um, contests on the ranch. Right, that's what they were doing. They were working right alongside the men. Um, as I said, the, um, the, the legality or pushing uh, women riding side saddle is something that doesn't really change until 1910. In the late 19th century, there's a debate that happens in the United States in syndicated columns in San Francisco and in New York. Um, it's interesting that it starts on both coasts and then it kind of backfills into the Midwest in the rural areas. Um, but the debate about whether women in the United States should ride astride goes to London and Australia. So um, there's more about that in the article that um, is in the Montana uh, Journal. But um, this is one way that they start to push back. Working on a side saddle in the rougher terrain in the American West, often on horses that are not walking horses that you see in the East, but that are more descendants of Mustangs or Cayuse. Um, it, it's a challenge. These side saddles have to be um, tailor-made, especially for young girls growing up, because um, if they're not fitted properly, then you have problems and sores, you're, there's even, um, there are articles about one leg overdeveloping, the muscles in that leg. And so um, these women really use this kind of as a, a grounding um, um, argument for their freedom. In the West, they have to have the choice to ride astride for their safety. And it's not practical to work cows on a, a side saddle. There's a woman in Texas who tried it on her ranch, and um, she was on a young horse. He ran right up the side of the fence, just shredded the leather on the side of this on the saddle because they're made from a softer leather. So there are a lot of um, um, a lot of pieces to that, and like I said, it's in the um, the journal article. But this is one way that they challenge these um, limitations to women. And um, where initially side saddles give women a lot of liberty to travel in the East, it does, has a reverse effect in the West. Um, also, they, like I said, will, will expand in other ways. And um, one of the, the ways that they do this is through the rodeo. I wanted to clarify, too, the parameters of this project um, is really the rodeo that leads to professional um, uh, the professional organized sport today. So this is the this is studied through the early days of what today is the Professional Rodeo Cowboys Association or the PRCA. There are hundreds of different types of rodeos, 
So I could probably write a few volumes about that, but um, this study really looks at the women who grew up in the professional sport. As um, uh, women in rodeo at the time, from the 1890s to 1935, they rode Bronx, they roped, they were steer wrestlers, they rode steers and then later bulls. So they were competing in every event that the men were competing in. And early on, they were competing against the men. But it's right here in Pendleton where a woman almost wins the all-around. And the men say, whoa, that is enough. We're going to have two separate categories now. We're going to have a ladies' champion and a man's champion. So the stories like this really make this research interesting. It's the stories like Rose Henderson. Um, Prairie Rose Henderson was a bronc rider, and she entered the saddle bronc riding in 1901 at the Frontier Days in Cheyenne. Cheyenne is a huge rodeo now. And she goes to sign up, and the committee said, you can't ride because you're a woman. And she said, let me see the rules. Do the rules say that it excludes women? Oh, no. No, it doesn't. And so she made them let her ride, and she did well. Um, another aspect of this that I, I um, also have to kind of mention as background is that the fact that these women are professional out athletes makes them outstanding. As I mentioned, it's the first professional sport in the United States for women, um, but they had a lot of obstacles to overcome. And one thing that cowgirls are able to do by participating in a male sport and one that is an extreme sport um, is that they remove those limitations that women had as athletes. There was um, a lot of concern when women started riding bicycles, when they were interested in basketball or um, tennis and other things. There were uh, newspaper articles that were concerned about women's physical well-being. Um, also, their uh, physiological risk because they, were, they had delicate reproductive systems. And um, there was concern that the more masculine the sport, the more likely a woman was to lose her femininity. And in worst cases, she would completely transform to be so man manly-like that she couldn't marry. And so these are concerns nationally. Um, there were a lot of restrictions on women being involved in athletics um, early on. The medical community added to this, trying to put social pressure on women um, warning them that physical activity like bicycling, um, in doing that, women risk, and I'm going to quote this, uterine displacement, spinal shock, pelvic damage, and hardened abdominal muscles, like what everybody wants now. So, <laughs> so certainly in the context of rodeo, a woman on a bronc, you know, that's going to just be irre irrevocable damage. So um, women are able to kind of dispel this myth. They take control of their bodies. So furthermore, the rodeo um, is a sport that, that athletes ride through injuries. Um, we have a lot of athlete, athletes ourselves who try to play through sprained ankles and et cetera. In rodeo, that looks like um, concussions, broken bones, um, sometimes more severe injury, and they try to work through it. But in, in this way, women are able to kind of take more agency or more control over their own body and decide if they're going to, um, if they're going to um, ride or not because of the injuries, and most of them did. Um, finally, I'll just um, mention that how important this is that um, scholar Susan Kahn in uh, Coming on Strong argues that sports will alter the balance of power between the sexes. She said it changes lives. It empowers women, thereby um, uh, changing everything. The truth is, even when feminism is not an individual's motivating force, it is the result. And again, I think these cowgirls kind of perfectly portray that. So people will really take notice of these women. They get their start in 
the public forum through Wild West shows. So women are, are contesting on the ranch um, with the other vaqueros, the cowhands, the cowboys, but they meet the public through Wild West shows. Now this is um, not an athletic contest. This is a show. It is uh, scripted and women who have initially very specific roles in the uh, Wild West shows. Uh, Buffalo Bill writes them in more as damsels in distress. They're often rescued by cowboys um, who he recreates uh, and gives them a, a decent image. Um, and so that's how they start in the Wild West shows. And then um, they work their way up to um, what are called exhibition um, ridings. And so they will ride Bronx as show, not as contest. So they'll show people, women in the West can do these things. They can ride Bronx. Annie Oakley can shoot incredibly well. Um, and they don't turn into overly masculine looking women when they do this. And so people will see this. The Miller Brothers um, uh, Wild West show will travel 15,000 miles in one year. They perform before audiences of thousands. And as um, they go and meet um, audiences in the thousands in Chicago and in New York and in Boston, they, the audience members really take note. Look what those Western girls can do. And look how feminine they are. Annie Oakley made certain that she had a very specific feminine image. The cowgirls, too, by the time rodeo comes around, and it's kind of hard to see Lulu Parr's, um, uh, what she's wearing right here, but um, the cowgirls, too, will work on that initially, and I'll get to that in just a second. I just want to point out, too, that um, even though they're not outwardly protesting as feminist, people are noticing what they're doing. They're living more independently. They're making choices that women in the rest of the United States cannot. Even Bill Cody says the women in his Wild West shows are paid the same as men, as they should be. Now, I will tell you, I've been to Cody, Wyoming. His payroll records do not reflect this. <laughs> but he said he would stand for that. Like He believes that. Oops, sorry. All right. So, uh, rodeos by the 1890s. Women move out of Wild West shows into rodeos, and this becomes an effective way for towns in the West to kind of increase their business through tourism. Um, in the Cheyenne Frontier Days in 1897, um, they are working to bring tourists in, and they estimate that um, the first show there had 15,000 people attend. Like I said, they rode Bronx, and this is such an impressive photograph. I mean, not just the fact that she stayed on, but that someone captured that <laughs> in, is amazing. Um, they also roped steers, like you see. This is who my dog is named for, Jared. Mabel. Mabel Strickland is who my dog's named for. So uh, she ropes these uh, big steers. These are the same size steers as men rope, by the way. Um, so they have about 13, or excuse me, 15,000 people come in. Um, they had also had rain that flooded out the infield where they were rodeoing and the cowboys were protesting. They didn't want to ride. It was too dangerous. A horse might go down. But this lady, Bertha Kaepernick, had ridden to Cheyenne from Colorado to enter the bucking contest. And this is how the committee uh, chair, Warren Richardson, described her ride. Miss Bertha Kaepernick entered the bucking contest, also the wild horse race, and my brother Clarence, who was in charge of the programming, conceived the brilliant idea of getting this girl to ride a wild horse in front of the grandstand. This she did, one of the worst buckers I have ever seen, and she stayed on him the whole time. Part of the time he was up in the air on the hind feet and he fell backward. And the girl deftly slid to one side only to mount him again as he got up. She rode him in the mud to the finish and the crowd went wild with enthusiasm. The result is the cowboy said, 
if a girl can ride in the mud, <laughs> we can too. And so the show went on. Um, he went on to say, though, that the real active idea of woman suffrage is thus demonstrated in Wyoming at the Frontier Days show. So people are paying attention. Fanny Sperry Still from Montana um, um, also described her career um, saying that um, she found it normal for a woman to have an all-consuming love of horse flesh. And she said that the horse had shaped and determined her life. She said, I lived when I wanted to, the way I wanted to, which was true of many of the cowgirls who shared Fanny's love for the sport and their career. 1912 was also um, a, a year that Bertha Kaepernick, who you just saw, um, traveled to Calgary, Stampede in Alberta. Um, she also went to Australia um, and continued to ride Bronx until the 19 teens um, when she changed her career still in the rodeo as a pickup woman. Now we call them pickup men today in rodeo still because most of the rodeos use male. Um, a pickup person is someone like the uh, horse you see here in the bottom right photo. He's kind of observing her riding the bronc. Those people ride up beside the bronc rider at the end of the ride and help them get off their horse. That's a pickup person. I, I call them pickup persons, but um, she did this uh, job for quite some time. There was a large rodeo in England in 1924, and the women who traveled with that rodeo uh, group did so at their own expense and their, used their own money. Um, and they, they uh, performed in England before 35,000 people. So um, it was popular, and people who saw them making this change by living these feminist activities um, again, took note. In 1926, I mentioned earlier that they managed their own careers. Billboard magazine sent an advertisement out to the Greenall sisters and Alice and Margie responded to the magazine um, headline. It said, Bronc Riders Wanted. And the ad didn't say who, so they responded and they got an answer back that said, yeah, we don't really care if you're female Bronc Riders, come on. And so they earned a job doing that. Um, making pretty good money, $25 a week with room and board, whereas working on the ranch, they were making $40 a month. So this was pretty good money for them as well. On that note, um, the height of rodeos, the 1920s um, um, and during the golden age of sport, and um, rodeo contestants were making 10 times the average uh, per capita income. Women were able to um, make incredible amounts of money. In 1935, cowboys are making $2,000 annually. Um, Tad Lucas was making $12,000 a year as a cowgirl. And some of that's contracted money. So she's guaranteed a check. The other thing that women uh, do is they're able to continue working after they marry. Um, now, marriage, rodeo marriage is a hard one. So um, a lot of them who were married to other rodeo contestants did pretty good for a while. Um, but those women who were married to non-rodeo people, those marriages didn't last. And they have a pretty high divorce rate. Um, um, some of them, too, like Jean Krieg, who you see here, she got married um, right after the bronc riding at the Cheyenne Frontier Days Rodeo. <laughs> And her husband rodeoed too, and their, ro their honeymoon was driving down the road to another <laughs> rodeo. <laughs> so that was their honeymoon. Um, another woman, Vera McGinnis, and she's the only woman who left us an autobiography, but Vera McGinnis had married a man who was in rodeo, and their careers really diverged. He was injured and unable to continue rodeoing, and he wanted her to quit, and she just couldn't. And she made the statement, you know, it never occurred to me to quit rodeo to save my marriage. That's how dedicated these women were to their careers. All right, that's Vera. She's always known for her big hat. So I think one of the more 
the, the change that we see other women incorporating first after watching rodeo cowgirls, aside from getting involved in athletics, is fashion. I think this is the most clever form of resistance that they have. Um, and a lot of this comes about because of, um, because of the need to, to uh, be safe in the arena. Now, they recognize pretty early on that they need to show the audience that they have to remain feminine. And so they overcompensate with these big, um, they have silk blouses. They ha this is a bow behind her hair. And a lot of them are shoulder to shoulder bows. Um, and they, you, she's got her pearls on, and uh, these women would ride um, in very feminine blouses and um, things like that. Lucille Mulhall um, in 1905 is going to appear in Madison Square Garden, and it's there that she will have her skirt hung up in the stirrup and be dragged. And so this is one of the arguments that they make, that we need, we need to change the skirts so that women don't, don't become injured. Um, uh, Vera McGinnis, <laughs> when she first rodeoed, she said she dug out her riding clothes. It was a khaki uh, divided skirt like you see here, and um, she said some hand-me-down English boots, and she wore a corset to ride in her first relay race, and it nearly killed her. And she said, I didn't think about it because she was not from a ranching family. Um, and so from then on, she decided to uh, be a part of making their own clothing, and a lot of them did make their own clothing, and ensuring that it was uh, secure and safe for them. They move from the split skirts to um, this interesting kind of adaptation of pantaloons, but they used elastic and other ribbons to kind of tie up the split skirts um, so that they, again, you know, had less chance of getting those caught in the saddle. Um, and then after World War I, they adopt the doughboy look with these jodhpurs. And you can see here some of them are silk, so they're still very feminine. And then, of course, those giant hats. Um, and then finally, it's not until 1922 that they are able to start wearing pants. This happens in Fort Worth, Texas, and they have kind of a um, bell-bottom pant. The cowboys um, stood up for them in Texas because the rodeo committee said, you're not wearing pants in the arena. We're going to cancel the rodeo. And the cowboys said, if the girls don't ride, we're not riding. And so they had to let them ride. And from then on, women wore pants. Um, finally, um, I will just say that, uh, because I'm out of time, just about, I want to make sure we have time for questions. One of the descendants of, of uh, Tad Lucas that I mentioned earlier, her daughter rodeoed very early, Mitzi Lucas, um, said she compared the differences uh, between the women in the women's liberation movement to the cowgirls of her mother's generation, which was the 1920s when she was in her heyday. Um, and she said those cowgirls um, uh, did not really have, um, didn't feel like they had restrictions. There was no reason you couldn't do what you were doing as far as making a career in rodeo. And um, she said the, the liberties that women had um, in rodeo were not the liberties that other women in the country had at the time, which make them stand out even more. And um, they, uh, she said, my mother's generation were definitely their own women. Some of them were married, and they just lived their own life. And I always said that my mother was the most independent, probably the first feminist that I can ever remember, even if it wasn't popular then, and we didn't even know she was. Thank you. Uh, any questions? Back during that era um, in women's rodeo, um, they did ride steers and some rode bulls. And, you know, I think that they rode with two hands instead of one, like the men. Is this on? Yeah, can you? Okay. Yes, that's correct. Um, so... In once, especially once they split the categories between men's competition and ladies' competition, 
um, they will start to make changes and allow the women two hands on right. the steer, um, and and so they and they also can later have two on Bronx, but um, initially they don't. They ride the same as the men. Okay, yeah. Well, I'm an old bull rider. I used to ride Are bulls you? when <laughs> I was a young man, you know. And uh, one more question, going back to the. Hall of Fame mm -hmm. in Oklahoma City. Uh, have you heard of a woman named uh, Wilma Tate? I have. Okay. Yeah. Well, She's a I little knew. outside of the time period I studied. Yeah, so. it is. So I just, you know, just wanted to ask that question. I have a lot more questions, but I'm pretty sure somebody else got questions. <laughs> Thank you for that. So what happened? Why are women so restricted in the uh, events that they can participate in now? In rodeo specifically? Excellent question. Um, I'll try to give you the short answer. So, <laughs> so um, in the 1930s with the Great Depression, more men start to enter competition who are not raised on ranches, working right alongside women. And they are resentful of the fact that women are making so much money. And so when the, the first union will organize for the Cowboys in 1935, the Cowboy Turtle Association, um, women can be members but non-voting members. And at that point, we really start to see um, women being pushed out of those events. Now, some of that discussion had started happening in 1929 when Bonnie McCarroll was killed here in Pendleton on the Bronx. Um, but she's not the first cowgirl to be killed, and she wasn't the last one to be killed on a bronc. Women were not disproportionately um, injured or succumbed to, um, uh, succumbed to their injuries more so than cowboys. But it was an excuse that they needed because she was a very popular cowgirl. It was widely publicized. So that's the beginning of it. During uh, World War II, when the men come back from World War II, we see a drastic change. So 1941 is the last time a woman rides a bronc in a regular co-ed rodeo in Madison Square Garden in New York. And um, when the men come back, it's just a change. We see them uh, encouraging girls to be, to be sponsor girls instead of athletes. So it's more of a beauty pageant contest. We see the cowgirl image change. They, um, largely in part due to Jean Autry, will start <laughs> wearing um, short very short skirts, um, white boots, halter tops, and jackets. So they look like uh, pinups on a maybe on a fighter plane from World War II. Um, and so that changes a lot of it. And women are going to be pushed out of rodeo at that point, um, at least in the professional capacity. They will start their own association. And the Girls' Rodeo Association will evolve into the Women's Professional Rodeo Association. And they will be able to um, kind of work their way back into professional rodeo um, through barrel racing. But that's the only event until 2018 when they agreed to add in breakaway roping. So uh, also part of that is the social image that the United States wanted to create during the Cold War. There's a big push for women to be part of the nuclear family, um, to, to present an image that was, you know, a husband, wife, 2.5 kids, and, um, and so to combat communism in the United States, that was also a, a plays a part in the image and why it's changing. It's a great question, thank you. Thanks for coming. Thank you, Tracy, that was so, so interesting. Um, I, I don't know how to quite frame this, but I'm thinking about their rejection of the label of feminist, right? And that makes sense, I can track that. But I also am thinking about what you're talking about is um, uh, being heavily influenced by the waxing and waning of, of different kinds of masculinity, right? Mm -hmm. So there was a masculinity that seems to have allowed that kind of equity on the ranch and equality, a masculinity that allowed for them to compete as co-equals, and certainly changing financial economic circumstances in the war alters masculinity in such a way that there's it's threatened and that has adverse effects on them. So maybe the question I want to ask is, at some point, do any of them recognize that 
that shunning or putting some space between them and a feminist movement ha has harmed them in the long run. D does that make sense? Yes. Like, we had yeah. we organized, had we identified more collectively as women who want this thing, um, we might be able to combat these changes that are coming in? Or do you think it was, that wouldn't have made any difference? I really don't think, y so you're, if I understand what you're asking me, did they recognize that perhaps if they had joined the national movement, they might have also had um, uh, maybe a faster change to the, the fashion changes they wanted to make or uh, fair payouts or the Bronx that they were requesting and sometimes they had to really push back for those too. Um, this, is, this is why I think looking at them in the rural context is necessary. There is such a disconnect between their lives and the lives of the feminist who are moving for things on the larger scale that they already have. Um, and I, I kind of have come to the conclusion that part of that is the nature of ranching life at this time. These are women and men who are not part of the big bonanza ranches during the frontier expansion. These are m what I would call mom and pops. So uh, with that, um, more of the focus is on the immediate family. More of the focus is on being able to earn the money to get down the road to rodeo. And I think that some of them were concerned that that would take away from this really hard work that they were doing to keep their rodeo careers. And a lot of these women worked in the off season so they could rodeo. And I'm not sure if I'm explaining myself well, but economically, that's their focus and the, the things that they're advocating for are for safety to continue that career. And that's, it's just very different from what urban feminists needed. Thank you for that question. Any other questions? Oh, we're being exceptionally quiet. I almost always have lots of questions. <laughs> Who's in this last picture? I'm sorry, I can't. Who? I don't know. Okay. Who's in the last picture? Is that oh, a relative? That's my grandmother. <laughs> she is uh, my inspiration and um, would hate that I put this picture up. Um, <laughs> My my grandmother was very domestic um, and was probably forced to help. So this is, a, you, you ask about women moving out of rodeo. The other thing that changes is that the working in tandem with men sharing the load of the work by my grandmother's generation is not quite happening. Um, women at this point are doing double duty. So they're making lunch early in the morning and putting the fried chicken on the counter so they can go help work the cows and then come back in, have lunch, do the dishes, and then if necessary, go back out and help again. So women are really lifting the heavy during my grandmother and my mother's generation and really mine too, but thank you for asking. <laughs> important than it is. I was just wondering if you think any of these women think gender was a social construct given the labor that they perform? That's an excellent question. Um, I think to some degree they had to be aware of that, um, mostly with some of the pushback that they got and, you know, the little lady wanting to come ride a bronc. Um, so I feel like they were aware. In the some of the earlier um, uh, women writing at the turn of the century, and Lucille Mulhall's writing in the early 1900s, um, they, if they didn't know, they knew once the newspaper articles came out because they described her as a lassoer in lingerie. Um, and so the language that they use would certainly make them aware of it. Um, but again, you know, I don't know. I think they're trying to work um, in the system, to work around it, and not necessarily work through educational change to make men aware of that, um, like what we would see 
later, even after the Women's Professional Rodeo gets started, and um, we just watched some of the um, the women bull riders in the 1980s. So within the Women's Professional Rodeo Association, they get back on rough stock. And um, Johnny Jakowski talks about, even in the 1980s, trying to convince those uh, rodeo cowboys that she's not competing with them. It's an entirely different professional organization, and it's an entirely, like, she, she can't be that. And they finally realize they don't need to be threatened by her. Um, and so they kind of start to support her. So I think they know all along, but maybe just aren't working to make that change. But thank you for that question. I have one more, Tracy. Um, and this was kind of weird, maybe. It, it sort of is a, a takeoff on changing roles through the wars and over time. And I got to wondering if um, increasing mechanization on farms and ranches might have sort of pushed women out as well because, oh, you're not needed anymore. You can get back in the mm -hmm. kitchen. So I don't think necessarily out of rodeo, but it definitely causes a change in women farmers. Um, and I have colleagues in the Rural Women's Studies Association who do a great deal of research in that area. Um, it might have, if there hadn't been that encroachment in the 1930s of men who had not grown up on ranching, and I probably should clarify that by the second and third generation on those ranches, the men are equally as happy to support their wives and sisters and daughters in the rodeo because they work beside them every day. And women do the same work that the men do. Those who grow up in the city don't ever have that connection to women. Um, and there's, there's some really interesting research on, on those differences. Um, but where mechanization certainly affects farming, I think it's lesser so um, in the rodeo itself. And by that point, women had already formed their own professional organization. Um, and because a lot of these are smaller farms um, and not like the big, those big wheat combines that we see here on the Palouse and um, in the Pacific West. That's a great question. Might need to do a little more work on that one. <laughs> Time for another one. Yeah, thank you for the presentation. Uh, so back to Bonnie McCarroll and her death in 1929 at over in Pendleton. Uh, my understanding is that, that she got caught up in the hobbles. Yes. And that was uh, made quite a horrific uh, sight for the audience to see. And, and that, you know, part of the reason that they stopped bronc riding at that point was that it was really bad for business to see something like that. Absolutely. Yeah. The so hobbles, hobbles, I think, were supposed to to make it safer, to hold them on to the, the, the whole rigging, right? That's what the committees told them, yes. Um, some of the, so one of the changes to the rules that they'll make is to require girls to ride bronc on the hobbles. What a hobble is, um, on the saddle, you see the stirrup here. My grandmother's got it kind of kicked out. So a hobble is a piece of leather that goes underneath the horse's belly and it ties the stirrups down closer to the sides of the horse. And that means that if a girl's on a bronc, she's not gonna lose the stirrup because the, it's flying um, high. So she won't run the risk of getting a boot caught, I ideally, in here when she's on, off the ground. If her feet are up here, if she's marking the horse, then she won't, if it's tied down, she's not supposed to lose it. But what happened with Bonnie McCarroll um, and with most of the women who die, die from the hobbles. So um, the rodeo committees say that we're going to require it because it's supposed to be safer. But this is honestly a way to start working women out. Um, sh her boot gets caught and she cannot get free because it is tied in so tight on the hobble. And when she loses her seat, she's dragged around the arena by her boot. And she suffers severe head injuries. Um, in fact, it's three days later before she actually passes away. But the audience, as you said, shocked. Shocked. They'd never seen anything quite like it. She was a very popular cowgirl. And so requiring women to ride hobbles, a lot of the women said no. 
we are not doing that. And so it was one way that they um, started to try to push them out of rodeo. But thank you. Thank you for that question. Well, I think that's all the time that we have. Thanks again, Tracy.